Hello everyone and welcome to today's OSA Technical Group webinar, Photobiomodulation for Treatment of Traumatic Brain Injury and Other Brain Disorders. My name is Hannah walter Pylon, and I will be moderating this webinar on behalf of the Optical Society. We're very excited to have Michael Hamblin joining us for this webinar, which was organized by the OSA Therapeutic Laser Applications Technical Group. I want to start today by telling you a bit about our technical groups. OSA technical groups aim to create vibrant and active communities for all of our members to participate in. We offer members more than 40 different technical groups to choose from, and each of these groups are led by OSA members who volunteer their time to organize events tailored to your interests, such as today's webinar. And in fact, our technical groups have been hosting webinars regularly since 2013, all of which are available for you to view on demand on our website. So you can learn more about our technical groups, find out about our upcoming events, and access our library of over 100 on-demand webinars by visiting us at osa.org slash technical groups. Now, before we begin our presentation, I wanted to note that we will address your questions at the end of the talk. We encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar, and you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You'll also see questions from your fellow attendees in the Q&A box today. And if there's a question you want us to address during the question and answer session, go ahead, hit the thumbs up button beneath us it, and let us know. Then at the end of the webinar today, you'll be prompted to complete a short survey. So if you could provide us with your feedback, it would be greatly appreciated. Please note that this, this webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and a PDF copy of the slides will be emailed to you within 48 hours of the webinar. So now it's my pleasure to welcome Elena Vital, who serves as the chair of our Therapeutic Laser Applications Technical Group. She'll tell you a bit more about the technical group and introduce you to today's presenter. Elena, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Hannah. Again, thank you, Hannah, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, once again, uh, my name is Elena Vito. I am the chair of uh, the Therapeutic Laser Applications Technical Group, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, webinar. Before we start, I'd like to give you a very brief introduction about the group. On this slide, uh, you see the members of the executive committee for the group, and we are a diverse team of scientists, scientists with uh, backgrounds related to therapeutic applications of uh, lasers. If you want to uh, find more information about the group um, and overall about technical groups, uh, you can go to the main OSA page and look at the uh, Get Involved uh, tab. For individual technical groups, uh, the pages are located uh, here uh, on the left, and our group is a part of the Biomedical Optics uh, Division. Uh, on the, we have a separate page uh, specifically for our group, and you can find their information about upcoming events and about uh, how to get in touch with us. And information about past events is available there as well. So if you are not already a part uh, of our group, we would really like you to join us. And in order to do this, all you need, uh, all you need to do is to select therapeutic laser applications as one of five technical groups of interest at your OSA membership uh, account page. This will automatically put you on the mailing list uh, about our group events, such as this webinar. Uh, if you have any uh, questions about the group, any ideas for events, you can always uh, reach me directly at the email shown here, or you can email uh, OSA. And just to give you an example of activities uh, organized by our group, this is just for this year, uh, we host uh, webinars, uh, special events at OSA conferences. Uh, in April this year, we had the uh, Best Poster Presentation Award for uh, students and recent graduates, and uh, we host networking events um, at the Frontiers in Optics as well. So a lot of different activities, and we would really like you to join us. So now it is my uh, great pleasure to introduce today's uh, uh, speaker, Michael Hamblin. Uh, spent his career at the Wellman Center for Photomedicine at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and he's been a member of the Harvard MIT Division of Health Sciences and Technology. Dr. Hamblin is one of the pioneers and leading experts in the field of photomedicine. He has authored multiple textbooks and handbooks on uh, photodynamic therapy, low light uh, laser therapy, and applications of nanoscience in photomedicine. Uh, in this webinar, 
uh, today. Dr. Hamblin will talk about photobiomodulation for treatment of traumatic uh, brain injury and other brain disorders. It is my great pleasure to introduce him to you and Michael, please the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, do press this button. So can you see that now? We can. Okay, jolly good. Well, hello everybody. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, in this days of COVID pandemics, doing online presentations is going to become increasingly more common, so we all have to get used to it. So the title I was given is Fertify Modulation for the Treatment of TBI and Other Brain Disorders. Well, I'm clicking forward, but it's not actually going forward. Ah, there you go. So the outline, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of this whole field, which is surprisingly lengthy. A little bit about the mechanisms, because people always want to be to know about the mechanisms. Um, photobiomodulation, animal models of TBI, and then photobiomodulation and animal models of other brain disorders. And finally, go through some of the clinical studies. So getting on to the history, we're going back 120 years here to when uh, Neil Svinson won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1903, so 117 years ago. And if you look at his Nobel lecture, he, you find he had Neiman Pick disease, which is a, a genetic disorder, but he found that when he went out into the sunshine, he got a lot better. So he found out that the sunlight was having a therapeutic effect, he had anemia, tiredness, and so forth. So that spurred Finson on to look for other applications of light therapy in medicine. And what he got the Nobel Prize for was for cutaneous tuberculosis, but also for smallpox, which is another infectious disease. So in those days, you know, it was infectious diseases. Um, so that impressed people a lot. And Edison, of course, had just relatively recently invented the electric light bulb. And then folks said, well, you know, perhaps we can cure things just with electric light bulbs. So they started to build um, incandescent electric light bulb baths. And here you can see several of them. You know, there were like beds with electric light bulbs in and cabinets and all sorts of things to put light into the body. And John Harvey Kellogg of Kellogg's Corn Flakes was a big proponent of these electric light bars. And these are from a collection in his name, which is uh, somewhere in the US, not exactly sure where. And then in Europe, there was another big uh, push for heliotherapy. So going out in the sunlight, and they figured out that you got a lot better results if you went up into the mountains. So Rollier said, if you just go on the beach, it's hot air bath and not a sun bath. You have to go into the mountains to get the real therapeutic effects of sunlight. And the reason for that, some people think it's there's more ultraviolet up in the mountains, but the reason for that is probably because the mitochondrial metabolism is different at ele elevations because of the lower oxygen. So it actually changes the biochemical metabolism. <clears throat> Um, so fast forward a bit through the, through the decades into 1960, when Ted Maiman built the first working laser. And three years later, Paul McGuff in Boston was the first one to treat experimental tumors with a laser beam. And he published in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is quite an impressive journal, that tumoricidal effect of a laser beam on a 
human and experimental tumors. And then in Hungary, Andre Mester developed an interest in laser research and he got a ruby laser and he attempted to repeat Paul McGuff's anti-tumor laser treatment. But his laser wasn't particularly powerful, so it didn't actually destroy the tumor. So then he said, okay, I've gone to all this trouble. Let's see if we could cause cancer in mice in a series of experiments. And that also failed because we know laser beams don't cause cancer. But he did coincidentally observe increased hair growth, and better wound healing in the mice and the rats, which gave him the idea you could stimulate lots of things. Um, so the whole field started off with electric light therapy, heliotherapy, but it sort of started to be called low-level laser therapy, largely because of Andre Mester's study. And in those days, they thought laser beams had something magic in them. But today, we don't think laser beams are magic. We just think it's a convenient way of delivering you know, a focus spot of monochromatic light. But there's a lot of different names. And today, the field has settled on photobiomodulation. A, because we, don't, we know we don't need lasers. Um, B, we don't know what low means, because it's a very subjective term you talk about low this, low that and the other, but how low is low? And C, because we can modulate things. So like pain, for instance, you don't want to stimulate pain. So you can, we put modulation is because we can stimulate things and we can inhibit things depending on the pathology. Um, so the mechanisms, one of the main mechanisms is in the mitochondria, where you have cytochrome C oxidase, which is unit four of the mitochondria. And one theory says that the light can dissociate the inhibitory nitric oxide from the cytochrome C oxidase, leading to increased respiration, more ATP, more oxygen consumption. But other things happen. Uh, you get nitric oxide released, you get a brief burst of reactive oxygen species, you get changes in calcium. But one important thing is that the mitochondrial metabolism changes from glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation. Um, a lot of these things can trigger cellular signaling pathways. So ATP, cyclic AMP, this is June FOS, which is AP1, the ROS can activate protein kinase D, which can degrade I kappa B, allowing NF kappa B to go to the nucleus. So you get all these transcription factors activated in the nucleus, which means that a single exposure to light can have long lasting effects for hours, days, weeks, and you know, in some experimental cases, over a month with a single exposure to light because you stimulate all these signaling pathways and transcription factors. Um, as I say, this glycolysis to oxidative phosphorylation is important for two reasons. One is it activates stem cells. Stem cells live in their hypoxic niche, carry out glycolysis, when their mitochondria activated, they have to get out of their hypoxic niche in search of oxygen, and then they can proliferate and differentiate according to the biological cues produced by whatever the injury or the disease is. Also, this switch is anti-inflammatory. So macrophages have an M1 phenotype of pro-inflammatory and carry out glycolysis. When oxidative phosphorylation is activated, they switch to the M2, which is the anti-inflammatory phenotype. <clears throat> so you get all this anti-inflammatory signaling, but moreover, these M2 microglial macrophages can phage aside toes and get rid, rid of rubbish. And one bit of rubbish you can get rid of is the amyloid plaque that builds up in the brain with Alzheimer's and, and many other brain disorders. There's also signaling based on heat and light gated 
the TRP ion channels. TRP is transient receptor potential. And they can be activated by blue-green light via opsin, and turns out it's actually opsin-4. Or they can be activated by near-infrared light that probably is absorbed by water and produces a conformational change in these ion channels. And the signaling you get from activating ion channels is similar to the signaling you get from activating mitochondria, but there are differences. The calcium is much more pronounced with the ion channels. The third possible mechanism is this idea that uh, the interfacial water that is inside the mitochondria acts as ATP synthase, unit five, acts as a molecular rotor and it's slowed down by the viscosity of this interfacial water. So if you can decrease the viscosity, it'll whiz around faster and make more ATP. So these three possible molecular mechanisms. So one interesting discovery that happened not that long ago, actually, this was just last year, they discovered that blood contains circulating cell-free respiratory competent mitochondria. And here they say, does the blood we thought to know so well contain elements that have not been detected until now? So that's kind of interesting how they missed that, but there are all these cell-free mitochondria in the blood. And we know that mitochondria are one of the big photoacceptors in photobiomodulation. So this suggests that putting light on the body can have distant effects at other tissues and organs <clears throat> because the mitochondria are carried around by the bloodstream. Um, and having said that, you know, it's certainly clear that you do want to get the light to where the lesion is. Um, you know, if you've got joints or deep organs, we don't really know how much of the light has to penetrate deep in the body and how much can be systemically transferred by blood. So it's still a little bit of a mystery, but this is one reason why we use red and near infrared light because that penetrates best through tissue because the, um, the absorption and the scattering are wavelength dependent. So uh, and if you go up in the near infrared past about 1200 water absorption really takes over. So there is this tissue optical window in the red and the near infrared. Also, people talk a bit about the biphasic dose response. So it's certainly if you're doing experiments in vitro and cultured cells or in small animals, mice and rats, it's possible to show you can deliver too much light. So at the right amount of light, you get a really good beneficial effect. If you keep upping the dose, the effect goes away. It's not clear how important this is in humans, actually, because you know, it's not a narrowly balanced uh, thing of having too little, too much. Uh, so I don't think it's a big deal in humans, but it is worth considering. So getting on to the whole TBI thing, we uh, had funding to look at TBI quite a few years ago from the uh, US Department of Defense who were really interested in TBI. And it turns out that there are no really good pharmaceutical treatments for either stroke or TBI, that all these have failed, antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, neurochemicals, metabolism, excitotoxicity. Dozens and dozens of clinical trials have failed. The only thing that works are some physical treatments such as brain cooling, and hyperbaric oxygen and stuff like that. So we came up with this idea that transcranial photobiomodulation could help. And because we'd already shown in vitro, it inhibited excitotoxicity, inhibited apoptosis, stimulated pro-survival factors. So we thought we're going to do neuroprotection um, and stop the spread of the damage in the brain after a head injury. 
So the first study we did, we had um, four different lasers. We had red laser 665, and then three infrared lasers 732, 810, and 980. And we came up with a mouse model of closed head TBI. We basically dropped a weight on the head of anesthetized mice, gave a single exposure to the head four hours after the head injury. Um, it was uh, 50 milliwatts at 50 joules per square centimeter at 30 milliwatts, something like that. Anyway, single exposure with these four different wavelengths. So what we found was the red laser 665 worked like a dream, single exposure up to four weeks later, the treated mice have neurological performance way better than the uh, untreated injured mice. And with an 810 nanometer laser, we got exactly the same effect, pretty much a single treatment, four hours after the head injury, and they improved for up to four weeks. When we looked at the other two lasers, the 730 nanometer laser or the 980 nanometer laser, they ba basically had no effect. So this was um, reassuring because, you know, being um, a photobiologist, you really want to see some evidence of an action spectrum that some wavelengths work and other wavelengths don't work. Um, but this closed head head injury was a little tricky to perform, you know, you have to, you have to get each injured mouse to have the same amount of, of brain damage. So that was tricky, but there's actually a machine you can buy that will make traumatic brain injuries in mice and rats. Um, interesting that you can't have a big market for this machine, but it's very useful. So here we had an 810 nanometer laser and we actually compared different pulse uh, structures. So 36 joules per square centimeter, 50 milliwatts per square centimeter, either CW or pulsed at 10 Hertz or pulsed at 100 Hertz with a 50% duty cycle. So all three laser treatments worked as we assumed they probably would, because uh, we'd shown the CW one did in the previous study. But interestingly, the 10 Hertz one worked significantly better than the other two. So the 100 Hertz was the same as CW, but the 10 Hertz was significantly better. We're not exactly sure of the mechanism for that. I mean, the two hypotheses, one is it's to do with intrinsic brain rhythms where 10 Hertz is the alpha rhythm of the brain. But another possibility is that the 10 Hertz coincides with the half-life of the ion channels, which is a few milliseconds. So this was all to do with what we call neurological performance, which was not complicated mental function. It was basically balancing on a beam and being able to get out of a circle. It was really basic stuff. But then we thought, can we enhance learning and memory? which are the sort of clinical problems that really uh, trouble people with head injuries. <clears throat> so to do that, we use a Morris water maze. So the mice have to remember where the, first of all, you have a, uh, a platform they can see, then you have a hidden platform, and then they have to remember where the platform used to be. So they actually have to orient themselves, learn and memorize. And what you see here is that um, we're comparing one laser treatment with three, once a day for three days. Um, the three, once a day for three days was actually better than the single treatment because we reduced the dose of the light a bit actually to be able to show this. But, um, but this is the, uh, the latency time to find where the hidden platform used to be is significantly reduced by the lasers and the three is more than the one. So this is the untreated head injury. Um, so one important thing that happens in the brain is that you get newly formed brain cells. You don't get many of them, but you do get them. And you can detect them with this BRDU 
staining, so this stains replicating cells. And with the treatment that was the best, the three laser treatments, you actually get a significant increase in these newly formed brain cells at seven days. Not so much at 28 days, but at seven days, you've got newly formed brain cells. Um, some other important things you can have in your brain, one is BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and the other is synaptogenesis. So synaptogenesis is newly formed connections between existing brain cells rather than the newly formed brain cells themselves. They're, they're not the same thing, but there are, they are connected. So when you stain for BDNF, um, with immunofluorescence, you see that here you've got a lot of these red cells, and this is seven days with the three laser treatments. So the two, the one and the three laser treatments give you a big increase in BDNF. Not so much at 28 days. So again, it's a seven day phenomenon. Um, when you stain for synapsin 1, which is a protein produced when new connections are being formed between existing neurons. Here you see a lot of red, but and this is with these three lasers. But interestingly, this is at 28 days rather than seven days. So the newly formed brain cells are peak at seven days with the BDNF, but the new connections take longer to form than the new cells, but they're both very useful if you've had a head injury. Um, one of my collaborators, Mei Wu, um, also got funding to look at this, uh, she's at Wellman Center as well, to look at this uh, for the biomodulation for TBI. And Mei Wu had come up with these mice that were genetically engineered to be deficient in IEX1, which is an early, immediate early response gene. And she showed that the one, that the IEX1 deficient mice had a much worse response to a head injury than normal mice. So if they lacked this gene, they really didn't do well with a head injury. And when you combine it with photobiomodulation, which we've got here as LLT, which we only changed the terminology relatively recently, but the knockout mice have a big response to photobiomodulation, um, both with the uh, neurological score, the body weight, and even the lesion in the brain is almost restored to normal with the photobiomodulation. So the next study we did with uh, Mei Wu was this idea of metabolic modulators. So because the photobiomodulation interacts with the mitochondria, <clears throat> if you give the mice um, in the diet various things that change the mitochondrial metabolism, um, you can increase the effect of the photobiomodulation. And turns out that pyruvate is by far the best thing. This is in vitro studies, just to show that it actually works in vitro as well. But in vivo, again, similar results to what we saw with the knockout mice, that if you have the, uh, the pyruvate, you get a better, sorry, go back, a better effect than just with the, uh, with the light alone. So the combination of the photobiomodulation plus the metabolic alteration by giving them pyruvate improves the effect. This was one study we did with collaborators in Iran on sleep deprived mice. So the idea here is you put these mice either on a tiny little platform or on a big platform. If they're on a big platform, they can catch up on their sleep. They're quite happy. But if they're on this little platform, they can't go to sleep because they fall off into the water. And although they can swim, they don't want to fall off in the water. So they end up not going to sleep. So they have this sleep 
deprivation state and they have hippocampal oxidative stress and their memory doesn't work as well. So we found that when we gave these sleep deprived mice photobiomodulation, their uh, ability to get out of the maze was dramatically improved. Their uh, discrimination index in a, a different cognitive test, the what, where, which test was dramatically improved. And the oxidative stress, which was increased by sleep deprivation, was brought back down to normal. Um, this was another collaborative study we did with uh, Zhang, who's in uh, Augusta, Georgia. And he had an animal model that is a neonatal hypoxic ischemia. So if, if your baby has problems when it's being born and its brain is deprived from oxygen, it'll end up with brain damage. And, and this is surprisingly common, actually, that babies end up with brain damage due to difficulties <coughs> actually during the birth. So this is showing that the model works. Um, the PBM, uh, ATP, a lot more ATP in the brain. People have shown that several times. So these mice that um, had brain damage through having hypoxia ischemia shortly after birth, uh, their activity was again dramatically potentiated by photobiomodulation. Um, almost back to control levels. Um, here you see a, a big difference in the uh, escape time. Um, various neurological and cognitive tests here, but basically the, the mice with the hypoxic ischemic injury could be benefited by near infrared light to the head, which again has a great clinical applicability because what do you do if you, if you know you've had a difficult birth and the babies could suffer brain damage, get some near infrared light on its head. Um, we haven't really done any studies on Parkinson's in my lab, but the folks in Australia have done a lot of work with Parkinson's disease in animal models. But we did a systematic review and basically the, the take home message is in several different animal models of Parkinson's disease, putting near infrared light on the head can have remarkable benefits. Um, so there are all these um, different mechanisms that work in the brain. Um, and even today, we don't really know which are the most important. So you can, and a lot of them have been measured in animal models. You know, you kill the mice. It's easy with mice and rats. You can kill the mice, take the brains out, and measure all sorts of things. So people have showed there's less apoptosis, there's more antioxidants, less inflammation that's a big deal there's also less swelling in the brain because the photobiomodulation is really quite good at reducing swelling it opens up all sorts of lymphatic drainage and channels and swelling in the brain is a is a really big deal after a head injury um you get increased blood flow increased cerebral oxygenation this has been shown by uh, many workers that virtually anything bad that happens to your brain is going to reduce cerebral blood flow and oxygenation so not only strokes and head injuries but alzheimer's parkinson's and even psychiatric disorders have less blood flow less cerebral oxygenation uh, we personally think that these mechanisms are important. So the neurotrophins, the BDNF, um, the neurogenesis, the formation of newly formed brain cells from uh, so-called you know, neural stem cells or neuro neuroprogenitor cells. And then the formation of new connections between existing brain cells, which is the synaptogenesis. 
So aptogenesis is basically how you learn. So you, you learn by forming new connections between neurons. There's a whole army of beneficial things that have been shown to happen in the brain. And even angiogenesis is important with a stroke or a, a TBI. Um, you can get newly formed blood vessels to grow in the brain. That's a good thing. A lot of people who work in cancer always think angiogenesis is a really bad thing. But by and large in the brain, it's a good thing. So moving on to the clinical studies. Um, sort of foot biomodulation can be used all over the body from the head. I'm going to talk about the transcranial here, but you know, hair regrowth, very good for the eyes, dry AMD, blindness, dentists, TMJ, pain, uh, allergic rhinitis, deafness, oral mucositis, this is a cancer therapy side effect, um, fractures of bones, a lot of inflammation, um, tennis elbow, Achilles tendonitis, lower back pain, Wound healing, of course, arthritis, um, and even some internal things such as lung inflammation, which is important in the days of COVID. So several people are testing photobiomodulation for COVID, uh, reduction of effects of heart attacks, kidney failure. This is turning out to be quite important. And then a lot of sort of... Uh, wellness general health and wellness like muscle fatigue athletic performance hair regrowth uh, fat loss just putting light onto the belly can help with fat loss in combination with exercise and i said um, the ability to mobilize stem cells is important and there you might want to put the light actually on the bone marrow, on the long bones of the leg to mobilize the stem cells. So many different applications all over the body. And what sort of devices do people use? Well, because it started off as laser therapy, a lot of the companies make therapeutic lasers. And I've shown some of them here. Some of them are quite powerful lasers. You know, they could be a 10 or a 20 watt laser. And you can diffuse the spot into a big spot because you don't want to burn the tissue. Uh, so you're looking at power densities of less than 500 milliwatts per square centimeter to avoid heating up the tissue too much. But, you know, if you've got joints which are quite deep, hips and shoulders, the idea is you want a fairly powerful laser to get down that far. There's also recently a lot of whole body photobiomodulation devices which have come in since LEDs have become relatively inexpensive and powerful. So the Novo Thor is a whole body light bed with 500 watts of optical power and there's big panels. So a lot of these devices will have hundreds of watts of optical power, a lot more than you would get in a laser. But there again, you spread it out over the whole body, <clears throat> and the whole body can have, <clears throat> can have uh, two square meters of surface area. You know, so the power density is like 10 or 20 milliwatts per square centimeter spread over the whole body. There's flexible devices that you can put on various parts of your body and handheld devices. You wrap them around your knee and you have a sore joint. So some of the first work we did in the brain, which was, was with Marnie Naser, and these were two patients with chronic TBI. One lady was seven years after a really nasty car crash and her ability to do computer work had improved tenfold and she did so well she got a home use unit and used it daily for five years so it's a little led cluster 876 30 so red and near infrared and you put it on the head the second lady had multiple concussions ptsd and 
with her, they got some cognitive tests, like so the colored word interference test, the famous Stroop test, you know, you put the word red in a blue font and you have to not get confused. And these were stories of immediate recall and delayed recall, showing that the memory was improvement to standard deviation improvement, which is significant. So Marnie was very impressed with these two patients and then had a case series of 11 patients, which are listed here. And you'll see out of these 11 patients, one, two, three did not have a major therapeutic benefit. But the remaining eight were all markedly improved and some of them could return to work because they'd literally sort of been disabled. Um, you know, somebody didn't talk but became quite verbal, so really quite significant improvements in these people. And this was a trial on acute TBI, which was just recently published in JAMA Open, so it was conducted at Mass General. It took a long time to recruit the patients. Um, it basically used a helmet that was fitted with 810 nanometer LEDs, a real one and a sham one, and you couldn't tell the difference. And they had significant improvements in the uh, various scores that you use for TBI cognitive performance and what have you. So um, it helped these folks to get better. And they didn't have that many treatments because they were in the hospital. So when you're admitted to Mass General with a head injury, sometimes you're only there for two or three nights. So some of them only had two or three treatments with these helmets. But they did get better and there was also neuroimaging, fMRI imaging to show that their, <clears throat> you know, the blood flow and oxygenation in the brain increased. So in addition to chronic TBI, it works with acute TBI. So this is a trial from Canada, a company called Vilight, uh, started by Lou Lim, and he did a small trial to on Alzheimer's disease. So this is a relatively low powered device, but it has LEDs that go over specific parts of the head and they're designed to shine light on important parts of the brain, which are part of this default mode network. So it actually started off as a placebo controlled trial, but what we actually found was that all the patients who were in the placebo group dropped out because it lasted for 12 weeks. They had to come travel in to have light shone on their head twice a week for 12 weeks. So all the placebo group dropped out, but the active group completed the trial and showed a remarkable improvement. So this, the size of this improvement was about seven times higher than the large clinical trial for Aricept which is a cholinesterase inhibitor. It's probably the only approved drug for Alzheimer's and it doesn't work very well. So the photobiomodulation, about seven times better than the only approved drug. If you stop the photobiomodulation after 12 weeks, they actually deteriorate, which is not surprising because it's, Alzheimer's is a, a chronic progressive disease. But they were actually given a compassionate use device at this point, and then they got better for a second time, which is not illustrated on this graph. But and this was one patient, a case, case report, um, where somebody had fairly severe Alzheimer's, got twice daily PBM at home with three different devices, um, one on the head, uh, one on the body and one in the nose. So three different devices. This is the intranasal one here. This, this one went on the, the back or the belly. But a single patient, so not of any great statistical significance, but he did very well. Um, you know, the score from 
went from 20 down to 6, and 18 down to 2, 53 down to 10. The interesting thing was that the sense of smell returned. So loss of the sense of smell is really important in Alzheimer's. Um, and if you can bring the sense of smell back, it's a very good sort of prognostic indicator. And the caregivers also said, you know, their job was a lot easier after photobiomodulation. So moving into uh, psychiatric uh, conditions, um, a study we did quite a while ago, and again, it was a single exposure to the forehead with this little near infrared LED array. And these patients were assayed. First of all, though, at the time of the irradiation, this was a near infrared spectroscopy measure of the blood flow in the brain, which is a, another device. In fact, there are these pads here, these measure the cerebral blood flow. And that went up, that was at the time of delivery, okay? But the psychological tests were done two and four weeks later, single treatment with near infrared to the forehead, major depression and anxiety. And at two weeks, all of the patients showed, you know, quite a good improvement in their cognitive and their sort of psychological scores here. This is the uh, depression score and this is the anxiety score. It faded off a bit when they were measured at four weeks, but again, it was a single treatment to the head. So you probably wouldn't expect a single treatment to have a long lasting effect. Uh, this was a study that Paolo Cassano did, for, again, for major depressive disorder. And this is a laser. This was the actual phototherra laser that he put in three parts on the forehead. So he did six treatments, twice a week for three weeks. And, you know, these people slowly got better and it continued beyond the end of the six weekly treatments. So we've got some quite good p-values by the end of the study. And Paolo now has what he calls a photobiomodulation clinic in the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General. So when patients come in, they can opt to get photobiomodulation treatment rather than antidepressant drugs. Because antidepressant drugs, although they're big market, they're not very good at all. They, they have a, a lot of side effects and a lot of people do not like ta taking antidepressant drugs. Well, this was a study that recently we did again, Fred Schiff, he was the psychiatrist that did the previous one. And he used the same little LED device he puts on the forehead. And he got people that were addicted to opioids um you know again there was a lot of funding available to treat opioid addiction because the pharmaceutical companies had gone crazy by over prescribing opioids to all and sundry so um 17 got active for 17 got active photobiomodulation, 17 got sham. The uh, nine of the active group had a significant decrease in their addiction score and only three of the sham, and that was statistically significant. So because of all these clinical benefits of this photobiomodulation, there are a lot of people uh, coming up with devices. Um, put light on the head, some of them are helmets, some of them are LEDs you just place. This is an Australian light bucket. Um, it's a highlight, you already saw that. And there's more, and I've just picked some out that have been published, but there's more devices to put near infrared light on the head. <clears throat> this was a <clears throat> collaboration we had with uh, Agnes in Hong Kong, and this is normal, healthy adults, older folks, right? But anyway, they, they don't have any particular diagnosis. 
So we put light again on the forehead, three places on the forehead, and they're doing two cognitive function tests. So there's the uh, just simple reaction test, a category fluency test, <clears throat> where you have to point that this arrow is different from this one. You have to do it quickly at a computer, right? So you have to be alert to do it. Um, that's the Erickson Flanker test. The category fluence test is you get one minute to name as many four legged animals beginning with D or something like that. You, know, you just have to get as many as you can in a certain time. So the uh, Erickson, Erickson Flanker test but significant, but what was really important, really impressive was the category fluence test. So these folks could name four times as many <laughs> things in the category than the control people. So that made a big difference. Another study Agnes did again was on normal elderly folks, but single photobiomodulation modulation session to the forehead before and after stimulation they formed a cognitive test more from three back which is terribly important what that is but during the test she was measuring with near infrared spectroscopy the hemodynamic response in the brain so this device it has the nrs to measure the blood flow plus the therapeutic near infrared light and sort of um, there were only minor changes in the memory performance, uh, which you might think was disappointing. But what was interesting is that to get the same performance in the cognitive function, the ones that got the photobiomodulation had a lot less blood flow in the brain. So the title of that study was Photobiomodulation makes an arduous task less difficult. So they could do the same memory task, but they used less mental energy to do it, if you will. Um, this was patients that had mild cognitive impairment. So these did have a diagnosis, but again, they had 18 sessions of PBM twice a week for nine weeks. Um, again on the forehead of the patients and the white some of them had huge changes in memory visual memory verbal memory um you know, it's okay this is not big but that patient had a big change in visual memory so they either had a big change in visual memory or verbal menu memory or both so there's a lot of common pathways in these neurodegenerative and psychiatric diseases. We talked about inflammation, oxidative stress, excitotoxicity, mitochondrial dysfunction, apoptosis, low BDNF, impaired neurogenesis, hippocampal shrinkage, impaired synaptogenesis, cortical shrinkage. Um, you know, so whether you have a degenerative brain disease or a psychiatric brain disease, or you've had a stroke or a head injury, a lot of these pathways will be found in common. Not all identical by any means, but a lot of these pathways are in common. So when you start thinking of all the different brain disorders you could in principle treat, you get quite an impressive list. So, you know, we talk about birth trauma. If you've had a heart attack and the blood supply to your brain is interrupted, there's a good chance of you having brain damage. Um, you know, there's been a, one or two people try to bring people out of a coma by putting near infrared light on their head. Um, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, a lot. Um, psychiatric disorders, we talked about depression, anxiety, drug addiction. The PTSD was measured in some of the head injury folks. Um, turns out it's really quite good if you've got insomnia. It's really quite good for putting you to sleep to put some near infrared light on your head. And then there's autism and ADHD. 
there's been some preliminary studies with kiddies with autism and ADHD, and it's because it's harmless. There's no known side effects of putting near infrared light on your head. It's relatively easy to do it in kiddies. So the conclusions in fitted by modulation has a long history of over 100 years, but we're beginning to understand the mechanisms. And my lab started off doing animal studies at TBI, and collaborators do animal studies of other things. And I've been involved in quite a few clinical studies and even works on healthy people for cognitive enhancement. So that's the uh, final slide. This was my group um, before I sort of retired and moved back to the UK, which was about a year and a bit ago. And we had various kinds of funding from agencies. And uh, thank you all for listening. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. We're going to now move into our question answer session. So we already have quite a few questions, but if you have one you haven't put into the Q&A box, now's the time to do it. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we have time for. Um, so the first question for you today asks, when irradiating the head, what fraction of the light penetrates the skull to the brain tissue? Okay, so that's been studied quite widely, actually, both in experimental animals and in humans with, you know, cadaveric heads and things. Okay, it's not a living head with blood flow, but anyway. So in humans, we reckon about one and a half percent gets through the scalp, the skull to the surface of the brain. In animals, it's considerably higher. So in mice, it could be as much as five percent. Um, but in humans, probably 1% to 2%, depending on which part of the head, because the skull has different thicknesses in different places. All right. Well, thank you very much for answering that one. We'll move on to the next question, which asks, what are the main challenges from a technical standpoint that limit the effectiveness and applicability of low-level laser therapy in a clinical setting? Okay, so the, the main limitation is heat dissipation. So if you're using LEDs, the LEDs themselves generate heat. And, you know, they're about one third optical efficiency. So two thirds of the electrical power you put in is heat and you need to get rid of it. So if you've got a device which is a decent amount of optical power, you'll have to have fans to cool it. And, you know, folks make devices with fans. So that's probably the main technical limitation. Um, you know, it's, as I said, some people think that lasers are important. There's no hard evidence that a laser is important. So it, if you needed a laser, that would be a technical limitation. But <laughs> since LEDs seem to be perfectly effective and they're a lot cheaper and a lot safer, um, most of the companies are going with LEDs. Um, as regards wavelengths, you know, near infrared is popular, sometimes a combination of red and near infrared. There's probably uh, 1064 nanometers, which is neodymium YAG, has been used by some groups, so that seems to be a popular wavelength. So either 810 or 1064, with or without some red LEDs as well. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question, which asks, in the mouse studies, was it seen that light exposure enhanced brain healing or just sped up a process that would have otherwise taken a longer time? Yeah, so several groups have shown that the size of the lesion in the brain is dramatically reduced. Now, the way lesions in the brain work is if you look soon after you've done the injury, there isn't actually a lesion. So the lesions develop with time, okay? Um, at the same time as the brain function is improving, which is because the undamaged brain is taking over the function of the damaged brain. So what you see is that with the photobiomodulation, modulation, the size of the lesion is much smaller. Let's say you measure it in one week or four weeks or whenever. 
the size of the lesion is much smaller. So it's developed to a lesser extent. Okay. So let's go ahead and we'll move on to our next question, which asks, have any adverse effects been documented when using light healing? Very few on the brain. I mean, Paolo Cassano did a study of any adverse effects in his depression and anxiety photobiomodulation modulation clinic. A few people record, reported a headache. I think one person reported like a visual disturbance, like flashing things in the eyes. Um, occasionally somebody will complain they can't get to sleep very well, although most people say that photobiomodulation modulation makes them sleep. Occasionally you'll find somebody say, ah, oh, you know, I was so G'd up after I put this light on my head, I couldn't get to sleep. So I think those are the only side effects is occasional headaches, occasional difficulty getting to sleep, and occasional visual disturbances. Interesting. Okay. So our next question today asks, where do you see photobiomodulation going in the next five to 10 years? Well, I think this is an interesting question because the field is split into two. So one part of the field is selling home use devices, right, which you sell on the internet. And you can't claim medical effectiveness for the treatment. So people will buy them because if, if they followed the field, they know that they work great. But the company selling them can't say, buy this device to treat Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or what have you. Um, and then clinical trials. So clinical trials are expensive and the companies find it difficult to fund a clinical trial because it's not clear how the companies are going to make money, right? They're going to make money by selling devices or by selling treatments, you know? So could a doctor prescribe a course of photobiomodulation to the head? You know, I guess you could uh, lease a device and give it to the patient and they take it home and use it. And, but mostly the companies sell the devices and because they want to make some money, they generally send, sell them as general health and wellness, which you is perfectly uh, approved because these are harmless LEDs. You can't do any harm with them, right? If you don't claim you're having a proven medical benefit, then you can easily sell them. But there again, a lot of people are not going to believe that they really work until they get randomized controlled clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So that's the dilemma that a lot of these companies face. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we'll go on to the, our next question, which asks, is the photobiomodulation effect on blood slash blood vessel properties significant and clinically important in the treatment of brain disorders? Well, I think so. I mean, you know, it's difficult to prove, but if you look at the amount of power produced by the violite, it's the whole device is 200 milliwatts. It's like nothing. So with the penetration into the brain that we know, it's difficult to assume that all the beneficial effect of the violite is due to light getting into the brain. So my personal feeling is a substantial part of it is mediated by absorption by the blood, but it's really difficult to prove categorically how much is direct penetration and how much is systemic absorption by the blood. Okay, so I think we have time for one more question today. Um, that question asks, can you compare photobiomodulation with other stimulations like ultrasound or magnetic? And do you think the mechanisms of all stimulations are close or different? Uh, that, that's a really good question. So there are, there are lots of non-invasive brain stimulation, which as you see, transcranial magnetic, transcranial direct current, uh, low intensity focused ultrasound. I think that the electrical ones and the magnetic ones have been shown to produce action potentials in the brain. So, so far, photobiomodulation has not been shown to produce action potentials. Um, now, the focused ultrasound may be 
more similar to the photobiomodulation because that doesn't produce action potentials. It stimulates brain repair probably and you know, neuroprogenitor cells and blood flow and it stimulates much bigger physiological processes and actually action potentials in the neurons, which is definitely stimulated by direct current and transcranial magnetic. But the sort of things they treat are similar, you know, uh, psychiatric disorders, neurodegenerative disorders, um, even strokes and TBIs have been treated with these non-invasive brain stimulation. It sort of suggests you might be able to com combine photobiomodulation with, say, transcranial direct current, because the mechanisms are probably slightly different. Interesting. Okay. Well, thank you so much for answering those questions today. Um, we weren't able to get to all of the questions, but I will share them with Michael after the webinar. Um, everyone, please remember that when you disconnect today, you're going to be prompted to complete a short survey. So if you could fill that out, we would greatly appreciate it. And then we'll be emailing you within 48 hours to send you a link to the recording and also that PDF copy of the slides from today's presentation. So I'd like to take a moment and thank Michael Hamblin for being here and presenting for us today. And also thank Elena and our Therapeutic Laser Applications Technical Group for organizing this webinar for us. On behalf of OSA, thank you all so much for joining us for today's webinar. This will conclude our session and you may now disconnect.